everyone and welcome to today's Savvy Investor webinar in partnership with Columbia Threadneedle Investments, Supply Chain Scrooge. This webinar originally aired live, so if you do hear any references to the Q&A box or resources to download, that would be why. Without any further ado, I'm going to pass you over to Mark King. I hope you really enjoy today's session. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Mark King, Head of Content for Columbia Threadneedle Investments and the host for today's Savvy Investor webinar, which, as you can see, is entitled Supply Chain Scrooge. Uh, so today we're going to discuss expectations for the holiday season amid the, amid the well publicised supply chain struggles that we've all been seeing. Uh, joining me for this discussion are Mari Shaw, Senior Analyst at Columbia Threadneedle, covering the retail sectors, and Anne Steele, Senior Portfolio Manager in the European Equities team here at Columbia Threadneedle. Thanks to both of you for joining the webinar today. So supply chain woes have indeed been well documented over the course of 2021. Uh, we've heard reports of port delays, uh, a lack of truck or lorry drivers and skilled worker shortages, not to mention scarce materials in some cases leading to delays in the likes of furniture, sporting goods and even milkshakes in the UK. Uh, so Mari, with all that in mind, I wonder if you could uh, start us off by talking about the supply chain pressures that you're observing for retailers. Sure, Mark. Thank you so much for having me today. Happy to join and discuss this very timely topic. Um, the truth is these supply chain pressures are not new. They've really been building through the recovery starting in the summer of 2020 and simply reflect, reflect demand outpacing supply. On the supply, on the supply side, the companies have been planning very conservatively, and there are labor shortages that have been exacerbated by higher than expected demand, which reflects the strong underlying consumer. So when I think about the supply issues, there's really two sides of it. The first side is availability. And lack of availability in manufacturing and labor and transportation has impacted retailers' ability to get the right, right goods to the right places at the right time. The situation has noticeably weakened over the past month, which is causing some concern into the holiday. But what I would say is that the retailers are not totally caught off guard by this. They have been working, as I said, throughout the pandemic to mitigate these pressures. And I do view most of the pressures as transitory. However, the pressure on the labor side may be slower to recover, um, even as unemployment benefits unwind. The second side of the equation is really the cost side. And we've recently seen an increase in things like cotton and fuel, but also continued pressure on labor in manufacturing and in distribution centers and in the stores. Again, I view most of this pressure as transitory and reflective of the imbalance between demand and supply. But on the labor side, we do view that pressure as structural, as we've seen wage pressure building in China um, for five plus years and in the U.S. as minimum wages have increased. Um, most of the companies as, that we speak to do not expect um, a bubble in costs like cotton or fuel or transportation, and they expect um, some normalization as we move into the second half of next year. But working with our freight analysts, we actually think we could see some relief in cost pressure as soon as the second quarter. Okay, so some relief there to come. Um, and are there any additional pressures that you're seeing for retailers in the UK and the Eurozone? And, and is Brexit an additional complication? Thanks, Mark, and, and good to join Mari and yourself. And I do agree with Mari that global commerce has been strained by the post-lockdown surge in demand from Western consumers who have been pretty flush with cash that they haven't spent during the COVID lockdowns. Now, at the same time, we've had ports have been constricted by COVID-19 restrictions. We've had a manufacturing in Vietnam has been really held back by a big outbreak in the Delta variant. Truck drivers in many, many countries are, are wondering whether the job is really worth the hassle. And we had a container ship block the Suez Canal for a week during the summer. Now, if you add to those bigger picture things, some of the smaller ones, like a, a fire at a Japanese chip factory, China closed dozens of coal mines um, because of accidents and safety violations. 
And also we've had months of unfavorable weather in different parts of the world, and that's caused a shortage of natural gas. So all of this has coincided with a pre-Thanksgiving or Christmas peak in demand that's coming up for container shippings wherever you are in the world. Now, UK retailers and logistics companies have warned about disruptions at the ports such as Felixstowe on the east of the UK. And this is now spreading to other ports across pan-Europe. And it also affects the, the larger London gateway. What's happening is that this backlog is actually forcing shipping groups such as Maersk or DSV to divert target vessels to continental European ports and unload UK bound cargo onto smaller crafts so that they can then come into different UK ports, but they're coming in late. And you also asked if, if Brexit was an additional complication. Well, you know, until 2016, the UK has been home to tens of thousands of truck drivers from continental Europe. And thanks to COVID-19 lasting so long, uh, many, really more than about a third of them actually went home. And thanks to the post-COVID restrictions on immigration, I'm afraid they're unlikely to return. So in the medium term, British truck truckers are being trained and recruited, no doubt on improved pay and conditions. And really for us um, as analysts and managers, the question is for how long are we going to see the squeeze and how much damage will be done to businesses in the interim? That is a huge question. Um, so, Anne, uh, how much of, of this is transitory versus longer term trends? Well, to be honest, I think both Mari and I would agree that actually all companies are finding it pretty hard just now. You know, COVID in this industry was all about shutting stores. But with freight rates up, anything up to tenfold and some additional boats being taken out of service for refurbishment, the picture is really quite tough. I suspect in time we'll see more capacity. But what I'm less certain about is that things are going to go back to exactly where they were before the, you know, before the middle of next year, especially as fuel hedges are being torn up, given the, the, the huge rise in the oil price. But so re managements hope it will be transitory, but retailers are going to have to be much smarter about how they use people. And clearly, we're going to have to watch wage inflation very closely. And, and Mari, I wonder if you've got any further thoughts on that. Yes, I would absolutely echo Anne's comments that we're unlikely to see costs in transportation like ocean freight and trucking and rail go back to where they were pre-pandemic. However, we do expect some alleviation in those costs, as I said, maybe as we move into early next year. I think the wage um, front is where we will see continued pressure. And especially in the U.S., as we think about minimum wage rates, we can we continue to see large retailers and e-tailers like Amazon and Walmart and Target continue to push up minimum wages to attract a better workforce. And so that is the area where we would expect continued pressure for years to come. But I do think the retailers are expecting that as well. Well, sticking with you and, and retailers, uh, how are retailers preparing for, for the holiday season amid all of this supply chain pressure that we've just been talking about? Absolutely. It's a great question. And I think that the retailers have really used this period to learn and get better. And we've seen greater financial and operational discipline um, that has continued throughout the pandemic. And we've also seen the retailers continue to do a better job with shortening lead times which is something that they had been working on for years in order to better read and react to changing business trends. Mm -hmm. However, however, given everything that we're talking about on the supply chain and the near-term disruption, the retailers are really having to make decisions in the short term that may deviate from those long-term practices in order to ensure adequate supply for the holiday season. For instance, they're taking delivery of goods sooner, and they're relying more on air freight. Um, uh, so I do think that inventory levels will remain lean through the holiday, given conservative planning and retailers' limited ability to chase. But again, we have been living with relatively lean inventory levels for the past year and a half. So I don't think that this will be um, totally revolutionary from what we have been seeing. 
Mari, I think you're absolutely right. And we heard from Boohoo um, that they were chartering entire planes to transport goods from Asia. I think the, the John Lewis group also are using air freight for urgent items for Christmas, such as Christmas lights, which were huge sellers during the gloomy pa um, you know, pandemic Christmas we had last year. And I think now that the weather's turning colder, we've seen increased demand for autumn winter clothing. Um, but the current situation is really hampering this. And, and we heard from, I think, Primark and Next recently when they reported their numbers, that they had 10 to 15 percent less stock than normal. Um, interestingly, Kantar data has also given us some signs of our early Christmas shopping. Um, for example, Thai sales are up between 5 and 10 percent year on year. Um, gift wrapping is up 10 percent year on year. And these are relatively small numbers. So it shows us that anxiety hasn't actually translated into panic buying, festive or otherwise, yet. And I think the other thing is that we, we spoke to um, JD Sport recently, and they told us that Nike didn't have enough truck drivers to deliver the shoes to their, their stores. And so they were actually going to collect them themselves. So you're right. Um, you know, retailers are having to box clever through this period. A question to both of you. Um, how's the luxury goods sector been faring and, and in what shape is it in coming into this holiday season? And maybe if you want to, to chip in first and then maybe Mari can add her thoughts after. Sure. I mean, Europe is the home for many luxury companies and, and many of them have really performed incredibly well during COVID. Um, and those with better management, such as Louis Vuitton, Mary Hennessy, have survived many previous crises. Uh, and really by digging deep and designing better, manufacturing ample new product, so things are fresh and increasing prices as they come out of a crisis. Now, this group has 75 strong brands, and they cover everything from hotels to handbags to jewellery. And, you know, with brands such as Louis Vuitton, with Dior, and newly acquired Tiffany, they reported incredibly strong numbers last week. The CFO in the conference call following that told us that um, he'd seen delays of only two to three weeks on some of the boats, and he really wasn't particularly concerned about supply con uh, chain constraints in port of four. Um, but, you know, and today we heard from Hermes, where on a two-year stack, the numbers were up 40%, and they are also remaining pretty confident for quarter four. Thanks, Anne. Um, I would definitely, I would absolutely echo Anne's comments. I think that as I look at high-end consumer spend in the U.S., it remains extremely healthy as income levels for these higher earners has not been affected throughout the pandemic. The wealth effect, you know, the rise in housing prices and, and the stock market has been very significant. And the consumers are unable to spend on other categories like travel. And so we continue to see very strong um, demand with in the luxury space and among high-end consumers. Also, these companies are relatively more sheltered from some of the supply chain disruption that we're discussing, since most of the production is done in Europe and not in China. Uh, Anne, Mari mentioned consumers there. Um, what's the outlook for consumers as we get edge closer to the holiday season? Are things going to be more expensive for them and if you can find them? Well, uh, absolutely, Mark. Prices are creeping up. So all I can say is do your Thanksgiving or Christmas shopping when you find the goods in store. Um, there's certainly, I think the, the real impact is that there will be less promotional activity and shorter sales periods um, for, for anybody to take advantage of. And, you know, when you hear goods taking 40 days to reach uh, the U.S. or Europe from Asia instead of the normal 20, yes, there are going to be some shortages. And we're going to have to get used to that over the short term. Yeah. And Mari, and, is, that, is that what you're seeing too? Yes, absolutely. And I would just add on that even though the retailers don't like to publicize this, products have been getting more expensive throughout the pandemic. Um, since the retailers have, have shown greater inventory discipline, they have been lowering their promotional levels and markdowns, which in effect raises prices. Um, and importantly, there's really been no pushback to these higher prices. There are some high visibility items like in the food category where consumers do tend to notice price increases, 
But most of the time on discretionary goods, the price increases are imperceptible to consumers due to the infrequency of purchase. So I do believe that, as Ann said, we will see the promotions, but they will be shorter in duration and less deep than what we've mm -hmm. seen in the past. And I would expect this behavior to continue not just through the holiday season, but for many years to come because the retailers now see the sales and gross margin benefits from selling more goods at full price. Uh Anne, as, as an investor in the retail space, as is Mari, um, how are you feeling about, about these companies? What, what are your thoughts on, on, on the sector and the individual companies within? Thanks, Mark. I mean, uh, to be honest, I'm finding that the larger, well-managed companies are actually faring better than some of the smaller ones. Let me give you a good example. Inditex is the company that owns Zara, um, which trades around the world. And it's, to me, one of the best logistics companies in the world. Only 60% of what they sell is sourced in proximity. So it, from places like Spain, Portugal, Morocco and Turkey. And it means that management for this company are really much more on the front foot. Now, interestingly, they booked 70% of the air freight capacity out of Bangladesh, well ahead of the competition, because they're used to doing this. And I think this is, you know, this is an example of one retailer in continental Europe that has top line momentum, they are seeing full price selling through and also operational leverage coming back again. Yes, and I can just add on to that. I would, I would absolutely agree that scale is one of the key determinants of the company's ability to manage through this challenging period. Um, but overall, I am positive on the group, and I think that the greater operational and financial discipline that we have seen throughout the pandemic will continue for years to come um, and will lead to ongoing improvements in sales and gross margins for a lot of these retailers. The one caveat I would just say is that there's a fine line between um, you know, between taking too much pricing and being selective and strategic mm -hmm. about your pricing increases. Um, and so I think the retailers do need to be careful and to not get too greedy. And a lot of them are talking about now using more technology to help them make the right pricing decisions. I also think that the companies um, with the strongest brands and the best product innovation are the most likely to see these price increases stick. So that is something that um, that we're very focused on. Um, I do have another question, but just, just before I launch into that, um, I'd like to remind, uh, remind all of our attendees that you can pose your own questions to Anne or Mari uh, by writing it into the Q&A box on your screen. So do feel free to send in those questions if you haven't already, and I'll do my best to get to them. Um, before we move to Q&A, Mari, is, is the market aligned with companies in terms of expectations? I think right now there's a bit of a disconnect between the stocks and the fundamentals. Um, and what I mean by that is that the market and, um, and a lot of the more short-term focused investors um, are, are um, very focused on the near-term headwinds like freight and cotton cost pressures and the outlook for the consumer into 2022, cycling a very strong 2021. And these short-term investors are really not giving the companies or the consumer the benefit of the doubt. And while I acknowledge these near-term cost pressures, I think that the companies have baked them into their plan and into their guidance. And as we discussed before, with a lot of these pressures being transitory, they really do not change the long-term margin potential or long-term earnings power of these businesses. So I would say I lean a little bit more positive on this space than a lot of my peers. And, um, and I think that, um, that it's interesting to look at a lot of the stocks here because I think there's a lot of bad news baked into them. And again, while the near term remains challenging, I don't think that the long term outlook will be as greatly impacted. I think I'd agree with that. that. Yeah, I think I'd agree with Mari because uncertainty really usually gives us opportunities. And to, I think during the summer months, we saw analysts bring numbers back a little bit as, as some of these problems began to emerge. 
And what we're getting now is we're working through quarter three numbers and outlook statements for the, you know, over the coming weeks. So I think quite a lot of this has already been digested. And happily, companies are being extremely honest and telling us about you know, good outlook statements, as we've seen from Hermes this morning. They're talking about quarter four, not just quarter three. So I think numbers have come down, but I think some of the stocks are beginning to look fully, you know, pretty adequately priced to be more attractive. Fair enough. Um, I'm going to move to some questions that have been sent in now from our audience. Um, first up, uh, Mari, maybe you could tackle this initially. Um, will the supply chain issues benefit the e-commerce players and Amazon in particular who have their own storage and transportation facilities? That's a great question. To some degree, yes, but I think, you know, if Amazon is still waiting for goods to come over from China and then those goods have to be unloaded at on the West Coast ports and then moved onto the rail system, you're still going to have a lot of that same congestion. Um, and so I would say, again, going back to what is one of the um, key characteristics that will separate the winners and losers this holiday. I think scale is really key, more so than is your business a retail business or more of an e-commerce business. So I think companies like Target, Walmart, Amazon, Costco, they will benefit because of their scale more than anything. OK, thank you. Uh, moving to uh, the next question. Uh, do you think the changes you're seeing in inventory discipline and pricing power are here to stay? Maybe, Anne, you fancy tackling that one? Um, yes, I do think they're probably here to stay because, you know, one thing that COVID has taught the whole sector is that you have to be disciplined. And I think retail discipline will not disappear from this. Um, and I think they will really be they're much smarter using technology, AI, as to how they're going to maximize productivity and, and really use their workforce better. And Mari, anything to add on that? No, I totally agree with Anne. I, as I said, I'm giving the retailers the benefit of the doubt, whereas I think a lot of other investors are not. I think they finally found religion. You know, it's taken decades, but I think that um, the... Um, the sort of perfect storm of COVID hitting and inflation really kicking in in a more structural way, like we said on the wage side, is finally forced the retailers to adopt a, adopt a greater sense of discipline um, on inventory and in other places on their P&L. And I do expect this to continue because I think they finally realize that they can do more with less. Okay, um, moving on, um, can you advise on whether you've observed more long-term changes in terms of trends in demand that could impact the sector? Um, who would like to take this one on? Uh, maybe I can start. I can start, and then maybe Anne can um, chime in. I would say that um, we continue to see similar category strength to what we were seeing pre-pandemic. So things like categories like athletic wear, beauty, home, I think those categories will continue to perform well, even coming out of the pandemic as they did coming into the pandemic. Um, I also think that there's newer categories like denim and accessible luxury handbags, which seem to have been re reinvigorated during the pandemic. Um, the other thing that I would say is in terms of channel mix, I think all of the retailers, of course, have done a better job in um, truly becoming indifferent between in-store sales and online sales, and they've all really improved their omni-channel offerings, including things like buy online, pick up in-store. And so I think that um, this new way of doing business and more of an omni-channel um, view of the world and of their business will continue. I think and, um, probably, are there any long-term uh, yeah, demand trends that you're seeing? Yeah, I think in Europe, you know, we, Mari hinted at um, the accessible handbags. I think we've seen 
more of a switch out of canvas into leather. Um, and I suspect that's going to go on. And, and as new products come out um, and, and the content changes, I think the price probably increases. I think um, the other thing that we're seeing, particularly in Asia, is more females buying and buying better. Um, and I think as a result of which, we're probably going to see a pick up in some of the hard luxury names, um, such as watches and jewellery names that ha have been slight laggards. So I, I would expect them to, to pick up. Okay, interesting. Um, um, a bit of a broad question, really, but are you seeing any, any incipient shortages or disruptions that aren't already well known? Um, Mari, perhaps you, you can uh, chip in. I think the one area we, where investors are now just starting to talk about this disruption affecting the business and inflation really kicking in and having potential negative effects would be on the food side. Um, and this, in, this is an area where we have started to see modest inflation, and that can be a positive thing for food retailers. Um, but as inflation continues to accelerate towards the mid-single-digit range, it makes it much harder for the food retailers to pass that through. And as I said, a lot of these food items are highly visible just given the frequency of purchase. And so I think the when I think about the food category and traditional grocers, that is the one area where we're we are definitely starting to see the inventory shortages um, creep into their businesses. And we're also starting to see the negative impacts of inflation starting to work through. OK, uh, that's the half an hour. Um, and that's all we have time for today. Uh, many thanks to, to everyone for attending the webinar, but special thanks to Anne Steele and Mari Shaw for their time today. Um, you can email us uh, any of your questions you think of after the webinar, uh, webinar by using the Contact Us box on the screen, and you can also download uh, relevant documents in the resources section. So, so that's it. Uh, thank you once again, especially to Anne and Mari, and we'll see you next time. So goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.